Let's get into the word just a minute if we can. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 1 today. Romans is the epistle of grace. It's one of the greatest letters that Paul ever penned because it speaks to the fact that we've been justified, that we've been found not guilty. It clearly presents the gospel. It teaches against legalism and judgmentalism and racism in this book. It teaches us how to live free and fully alive. We use that phrase here. It really comes from Paul's letters. We want you to live free. We don't want you to live under condemnation and guilt. We don't want you to live with the weight of religion pushing you down day in and day out to where you're a slave, not a son. You're a slave, not a daughter. You're a part of a religious organization and not a family. No, we want you to be free from religion and have the spirit of God on your life. That's why Abba's house stands today is because we want to see people saved, baptized, touched by the Holy Spirit, and we believe that the Spirit of God still moves, still heals, still saves. We believe God can still do something other than speak to us through words on a page. We believe God is still alive and that he still speaks and moves. So we've been in a series, The Good Life. I wanna to talk to you about the immersed life. Yes, it's a teaching on baptism, but it's more than that. It's about being all in. Whatever you focus on in your life will get bigger. Whatever you put your heart and soul into, you will see a harvest from that work. When you make something a priority, you will improve, your organization will improve, your church will improve, your family will improve, your finances will improve. Whatever you make a priority will improve. Can I get an amen? amen. And it's high time in the church that we die to ourselves, we do what Jesus said, we pick up our cross and we, and we follow him. It can no longer be about us. And it's hard because we live in this body of flesh. That's what Romans is about. It speaks to us about the curse of our flesh, the curse passed down to us from Adam, selfishness and greed and debauchery and sexual sins. And all these things are found in the book of Romans because Paul wants the church to be aware of the fight within. The fight within that you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you if you're saved, but you have a body of flesh that wants to eat the wrong things, go the wrong places, say the wrong things. Oh and you have that war going on. I heard this story years ago from the Cherokee Nation about a grandfather and he's talking to his grandson about the two wolves within, the good wolf and the bad wolf. And he was trying to talk to his grandson about doing the right things versus doing the evil things, good and evil. And the little grandson looked at his grandfather and he said, well, which wolf wins? He said, whichever one you feed. <laughs> and there's the same thing going on inside of us. And to deny it's just being ignorant because there's a war going on inside all of us. If we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit's trying to lead us and guide us in the right direction. But we have that old man, that old flesh that sometimes wants to do the wrong things and think the wrong things and go to the wrong places that sometimes wants to take us back to when we were lost and when we used to respond like a lost person. Wants to take us back to that place of rejection and that place of pain. But the Spirit is trying to lead us into the future, into the new season that God has for us. Martin Luther referred to the book of Romans as the perfect gospel. John Wesley, when listening to a lecture from Martin Luther in London, heard his commentary on Romans. He rededicated his life to Christ in the 1700s. The English poet Samuel Coleridge said that the book of Romans was the most profound book ever written. I'm telling you, there are riches in the scriptures. 
Romans 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? The apostle Paul is wrestling with legalists. What is a legalist? It's someone who puts the law above relationship with God. Someone that knows the rules, can quote the rules, can force the rules on others, but doesn't apply the rules to themselves. And Paul is constantly battling these hypocritical people. They're creeping into the churches, some that he started, some that others started. He didn't start the one in Rome, it was started at Pentecost. But things are happening and the apostle Paul is speaking to the issues in the church. And basically, what they're accusing Paul of is being greasy grace. I've been accused of being greasy grace. And, and there's the same war still going on today is you've got people who are so religious that they can't even celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. They can't even celebrate God's grace on someone else. They think they are in charge of who gets a second chance and who doesn't. They think they are the judge of the person or the pastor or the political leader that fell into sin. And let me warn you, my friends, it's not your place to judge others. You can judge the sin, but you make sure not to judge that person. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know all sides of the story. You don't know what happened to them when they were little. You don't know why they do what they do. And they're accusing the apostle Paul to the point of even assaulting him physically when he would enter into new regions. They would beat him to death over grace, scandalous grace. Can you imagine? Hey, God loves you, he died for you. He will forgive you. <laughs> it's like religious people today, they may not physically assault those of us that preach grace, but boy, they'll stick that nose up. I love it. Bill will tell you, I'll go out of town and I'll preach grace at a place that don't believe grace just to irritate the legalist. I love it. But what is, what is Paul saying here? Does grace give a person free reign to sin? No, that's not the doctrine of grace, my friend. It's not that, hey, I got my ticket out of hell. Let me just do what I want. God's cool with it. No. It's that, man, I'm so lucky to receive this gift of grace. I want everybody to have it. And I'm never gonna look at people the way I used to look at them because I realize that while I was in sin, Christ died for me, that he loved me when I was unlovable. And I wanna treat others that way because I received this precious gift of grace. What is the immersed life? Well, it's being all in means you understand that you've, you were dead to sin. You were dead to the penalty of sin. You were dead to the spiritual entanglements that come from sin missing the mark. You were dead to the curse of sin. You were buried with him and raised to walk in newness of life. When Jesus got up out of that grave, he left the remnant of his life on earth there. Come on. And he ascended to the Father. Everything that needed to be paid for was paid for at Calvary. Every sin you've ever committed was paid for on that cross. You can't force God to stop loving you. He loves you when you're unlovable. He loves you when you don't look like much. He loves you when you blow it. Doesn't mean he winks at your sin. It simply means that he loves you with an everlasting love. It's a covenant, it's a binding agreement that can't be broken. So you may have blown it today. He loves you, he loves you. So what does it mean to be immersed? It means we're to put on the Lord and make no provision for the flesh. That's what it says in Romans 13. What does it mean to make no provision? It doesn't mean you're not gonna occasionally slip up. It means you're not gonna put yourself in a position to slip up. Hey, if you've got a problem with drugs, don't go around drug addicts. 
you got a problem with alcohol, the bar is probably not the place for you. If you got a problem with your fat and carb intake, the buffet's probably not a wise choice today. You know, if you got a problem gossiping, wouldn't hang out with gossips because they're going to pull it out of you. Remember, whichever one you feed gets bigger. And we feed a lot with not just our mouth what we eat, but what we say. We feed the bad wolf sometimes. Don't shut me down while I'm preaching good. What is an immersed life? Number one, I gotta, I gotta move. It's a life free from the curse of sin. Not sin itself, but from the curse of sin. You're no longer under the curse of sin. You're set free, amen? That's what it says. Certainly not how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it. We don't have to because the curse has been broken. It's just as if we've never sinned. We've been found not guilty in a court of law in the kingdom. Somebody shout not guilty. <laughs> Number two, an immersed life's a life made brand new. We talked about that week one. It's being born again. It goes on to say, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know what that word walk means in the Greek? It's peripateo. It's a powerful, powerful word in the Greek. It means to walk about step by step to control and order our behavior. Habitually moving forward. So when it says there in our text, that we're to walk in the newness of life. So you've been saved, you've been baptized by immersion. You're to walk in the newness of life. It doesn't just mean you care, carelessly and casually stumble through life, right? It means you are carefully conducting your affairs in an orderly fashion that pleases God. It doesn't mean you're perfect and every step's gonna be perfect but it means you're being careful in the way that you walk, amen? It means you're being led by something greater than that of yourselves. It means you are habitually moving forward. The enemy comes when you stop moving. It's hard to hit a moving target. So keep moving forward with God. Don't get stuck in a rut. Keep moving forward with God. We haven't arrived. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer, stay speaking faith and watch what God will do. It's a life free from the curse of sin. It's a life made brand new. It's a life lived in agreement with others. For if we have been united together, verse five, this is an old school expository message. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So some of us have embraced the dying part, but we haven't embraced the resurrection. We still live like we're dying, not dead. Dead people don't get offended. Dead people don't get their feelings hurt. They don't have any. So we, including me, we have to learn to be tough, to let things roll off our back, to not get so easily offended, to ignore ignorance. You have to learn to ignore ignorance, not respond to it. When you respond to ignorance, it makes the ignorance bigger. Amen? Speaking of grace, I'll tell you guys a funny story. So, you know, we've built a great work there in the Dominican Republic in the Sinfuego. We've Got a tremendous children's center there. We've got kids now that are in private school, college. We've been at it 15 years. God's done crusades and feeding. We feed over 100 kids in the poor city. We've done stuff in Haiti and all that stuff. And it really all started with a covenant between me and Jose, who's there. He's an absolute mess, but he's my mess and I love him. And we're like brothers, we're like family. We love each other. People have tried to steal him from Abba's house. People have tried to get me to get rid of him, but because we've stayed in covenant, 
the Spirit is poured out on that region so many times. Thousands saved, feeding, all kinds of cool stuff's happened because of a covenant. But I have to be honest, sometimes I want to strangle Jose. <laughs> and I love him, like I've mentored him. He's very brilliant, very smart in theology. We debate stuff, we enjoy talking scriptures. But I had to teach him years ago how our culture is different from his. And that if you want to host people from America, there are certain things you have to do if you want their churches to come back and support what we're doing here. One, don't be late. Which he has a tendency to be late. Not in the last four years, he's been doing really good. But we would constantly struggle and with issues like that and he would just be delayed in what I had asked him to do. So me and Biggs were with him, I guess it was seven years ago and it was the first time we drove across the border to Haiti. It was a very crazy day. We almost got locked in Haiti overnight. Like we were sprinting as they were closing the border wall. We about got mugged, it was very stressful. So the next day, we get back to Dominican. We're supposed to drive two hours to the airport to fly home. I'm ready to get home. Anybody ever been on a trip just ready to be home? I mean, I'm ready to get home, ready to see my wife, ready to see my babies. I've been gone a week. I told Jose, I said, Jose, do not show up with the gas tank empty tomorrow. <laughs> Go ahead and fill the gas tank up. I'll pay you back before we drive two hours tomorrow. I don't want any drama because the car had ran out of gas, all this stuff. So he's 15 minutes late to take us to the airport. I'm already hot. We get in the car, we drive maybe 30 feet and the thing runs out of gas. <laughs> Man, I can't tell y'all everything I said, <laughs> but I was not a happy guy. I chewed him out every way I could, jumped out of the car, grabbed Biggs, he's laughing. <laughs> Pay a cab driver about $300 to drive us to the airport, told Jose I was done with him. He goes and gets gas and I guess he had to drive 100 miles an hour and he followed us for two hours to the airport. I was still mad when we got to the airport. Biggs was trying to, you know, talk me down. Jose comes in there and he said, you don't be mad at your brother. And that's what he always tells me when I'm mad at him. He goes, you, you, you're supposed to love your brother. So he comes in there and, and he knows that if he does good, he always gets a seed at the end of the trip, a cash offering. So he started hinting around after I forgave him for his seed. I said, you ain't getting no seed from me. But he sucked up to Biggs and I think Biggs slipped him some money. But uh, listen, it, in a relationship, Why'd you bring that up? Because there's times I've disappointed him. I, I, I've been wrong. I've hurt him. He's hurt me. In a relationship, you're going to have that. But the love has to be greater than the conflict. And, and the gift of grace has to be a mutual, mutual thing. If you're going to do something in the kingdom, it, it, it begins and ends with relationships, Right? And to have a relationship, you have to be a good steward of that relationship, but you've got to be willing to give the gift of grace. Life lived in agreement with others is so important. We've got to walk together. We've got to believe in each other. If I have a gift that will help you get where you need to get to, I want to give you that gift. If you have a gift to help me get where I'm supposed to get to, we need to be generous with one another. Amen? Number four, life lived in full submission to the Holy Spirit, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin, this is so good, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The body of sin, that phrase right there, is singular, not plural in the Greek language. What does that mean? What he is referring to here is not the sins we commit, especially the stubbing of the toe, the, the daily little blurbs. This speaks to the singular body that's under the curse of Adam. Are you with me? That one man's offense was passed on to all of us, but that Christ broke that curse. 
And when he broke that curse by dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, we no longer have to live in submission to sin as a slave. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christians shouldn't fear death. Now, you don't have to get excited about it. You know, there's a country song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. I mean, you don't have to get excited about it. But how many of you, you say, Pastor, I'm with you right now on this. I mean, it, how many of you feel a pool there every now and then? I feel a pool there. I feel a pool that this isn't my home. I feel a pool that there's something more waiting for me and waiting for you. There's an expectation that the Spirit placed on the inside of my life when I got saved and when I stirred those waters to where I know this isn't my home. But I'm gonna have a little bit of my eternal home here every now and then, it's called the kingdom. Life lived in full submission to the spirit. James 4, 7 reminds us that we're to submit to God and resist the devil and when we do, he will flee from us. It says if anyone would come after me in Matthew 16, Jesus would say, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's called being all in, being fully immersed being all in. You know, I've seen people in corporate America, pastor in two churches, not trying to give you my resume, but I'm just telling you, I've lived a lot of life. And I've seen many people, whether it's the corporate world or in the ministry world, and I've always wondered, what if they put everything into this for just a year or two? How much could God use them? And I don't mean that judgmental, but I mean, have you ever looked at someone and wondered, man, what if you really sold out for this? Have you ever felt that way? Like, what if you really worked yourself to the point of sweating for a year or two, where, where what you're called to do is everything. You're immersed in it. It's what you think about. It's what you pray about. It's what you sweat. What would happen if we as Christians truly got immersed in the word of God? truly got immersed in the spirit of God, truly got immersed in his church where it's everything to us, we'd see a shift, amen? amen. We wouldn't have to pray for revival, it'd be here. Amen. We wouldn't have to pray for miracles, they'd be happening. Evangelism would be made simple because people would be drawn to the flame that is you, that is you and you and you. Amen. What would happen if we were to get immersed what would happen, man, if we just sold out for what we were called to do? Yeah. Even if just for a season, if we made it a priority, if we walked by faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Somebody say immersed. He was immersed, Enoch. Have you ever read the book of Enoch? It's pretty cool. I don't know why they didn't include it, to be honest with you, in the canon. Enoch walked with God. He pleased God. And how did he do that? Well, it tells us how not to do it in verse 6. But without faith, it is, poss it is impossible to please him. So when you say, I don't know if this will ever get better, that's not going to please God. That's not speaking faith. I don't know if my business is gonna grow. I don't think my business is ever gonna grow. That's not faith. God's not pleased with that. I don't know if my kid will ever get off drugs. God's not pleased with that. God wants to hear faith out of you. It's gonna get better. They're coming back to the Lord. They're gonna beat that addiction. They're gonna get promoted. They're gonna prosper. They're gonna achieve their dreams. My church is gonna get better. My business is gonna get better. My family's gonna get better. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of the Lord. Faith is seeing that which has not yet been finished. It's being able to look at something and see it the way God sees it. He is a rewarder of those 
who diligently seek him. That's called being immersed when you diligently seek him. Number five, the immersed life is a life lived in celebration for the gift that is Christ Jesus. A Christian ought to celebrate God's goodness all the time. We ought to be a walking, talking, shouting, singing, praying testimony of the goodness of God. I don't mean weird. You know, some of you weird ones, y'all just, I just green-lighted you. I know I did. You know, I love what Bishop Bronner says. He said, the anointing makes you wise, not weird. And what I'm talking about, though, is influencing other people, not for the purpose of influencing them, but because we are immersed in Jesus, that they can't help but see Jesus in us and on us. Amen. That's being immersed. That's going all in with the gospel. Doesn't mean you have it all figured out. It means, man, this is gonna be a priority to me. Amen. Life lived in celebration for the gift that is Christ Jesus, verse 10 of our text. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves. I love that Greek word there. It means to credit, to judge, to consider. It's a, an accounting word, logiste. And it's a logistical accounting word. It means that we're to go ahead and charge the, the sins that we've committed, that body of flesh. Go ahead and charge that to God's account. Go ahead and charge it to God's account. Charge it to the name of Jesus Christ. Charge it to the kingdom. It's paid in full. It's paid in full. Hit your neighbor and say, it's paid in full. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, before you can immerse yourselves in the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. And you need to be baptized after you've been born again. Not my opinion. It's not a Baptist thing. It's a Bible thing. And I want to quickly tell you why you need to do it if you have it. Number one, baptism is a ritual to embrace, not a ritual to endure. It's a revelation we experience not a ritual we endure. God wants to speak to you. Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins. It is a symbol and it is part of our obedience to God. When we baptize to fulfill the concept of this ritual, we baptize you identifying you with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 3, Romans 6, 4, what I've just taught you. Romans 6, 5, death, burial, and resurrection. It's you saying publicly, I'm dying to this body of flesh. I'm being buried with Jesus and I'm being raised to newness of life, to walk, to carefully conduct my affairs in the kingdom. It is your profession of faith. When the Holy Spirit comes, it says in John 16, he will convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because you do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because he says, I go to my Father, right standing with God. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged and defeated. His power, the enemy's power has been taken away. Baptism is a revelation we experience is much more than a requirement to be explained. I don't believe that religion's gonna work in this rising generation. I just don't believe it works. Like you can't explain to somebody, oh, you're gonna do this to be a member of our church. I mean, no one wants to hear all that. How can this change my life? Tell me about Jesus. What do I have to do to follow Jesus? That's what people want to know. They don't want some lecture on church requirements. That's good preaching. Amen. I'll keep it up then. Water baptism should be a revelation you experience. Jesus came 
from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. How many of you have ever been baptized in the Jordan? Me, hallelujah. You got to go to Israel with me. It's awesome. And I go when it's warm, not like Pastor Ron, where you freeze to death to do it. I go in the spring. He went in December and January. You go with me, we getting in the pool somewhere, all right? We're going to get some sunshine. Um, Jesus is baptized by the forerunner, John the Baptist, one crying in the wilderness, eating locusts and honey, crazy guy. And Jesus said, no, nah, that's who's going to baptize me. And when he did it, heaven's open spirit descended on him like a dove. And Abba Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine John the Baptist and Jesus sitting there? How cool would that be, man? Woo, woo. You know, we get to meet both of them in person in heaven, amen? Spiritually, we get Jesus now, but one day we're gonna get to hang out and ask about it. Who should be water baptized? Everybody. John 3, 6 answers the question. It says, that which is born of the flesh. That's you. That's me. Mark 16, 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Story in the book of Acts chapter 8, the eunuch. Philip opened his mouth and began teaching the scriptures and he preached Jesus to him. And they went along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me or what hinders me from being baptized? So everyone should be baptized. How should we be water baptized? <laughs> Mark chapter one, immediately coming up out of the waters, Jesus saw the heavens open. You can't come up out of the water if you haven't been immersed into the water. Right. Amen. Now, I don't care if you get sprinkled. I'll sprinkle. Listen, I'll, whatever. Bring it all. But when you're saved, you're to be immersed if you're physically able to. Now, we've dumped water on people in hospitals and done. Jesus knows the heart of a person. Amen. But if you're physically able to, he ordered the chariots to stop. And they both, it says in Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Acts 8, 39. All you church cross people are loving this. It must have been a river, a large body of water. It had to be for him to go down into the water. Pictures are death, burial, and resurrection. Why should we be water baptized? Because Jesus says to. It says in the gospel at Pentecost and in the book of Acts that this is what we are supposed to do. When Peter preached at Pentecost, he said, repent and be baptized. He didn't say wait six months, pray about it write a doctoral thesis about it, go to seminary first. He said, no, if you've received this gift, you need to be baptized. And he goes on to say that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that this promise for you is for your children and for all who are far off. So what you do today will have eternal, eternal blessings attached to it. Amen? We do it because of obedience to God, because our identification with Christ, it's an invitation to our past to say, I'm leaving you here. You say, well, I pastor, I got saved when I was eight. I don't care about any of that stuff. We all make different decisions at different times in our lives. I'm saying when the spirit's on you, that's when you need to obey God. You invite your past to go down in that water with you and the spirit will affirm your soul as you come out of that water. It's an anticipation for our future, believing that God's got better days ahead of us. How many of you believe that by faith? I'm talking about the immersed life and I want you to have all that Jesus has for you. Would you bow your head with me today? Listen, we've got warm water and I'm not gonna force anything. I'm gonna have my pastors go ahead and come down Pastor Bill's gonna make his way up there in case anyone wants to run up there with Pastor Angie and some of our team to be baptized. But before we do that, I wanna give you an opportunity, number one, to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Before you're baptized, you need to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You need to accept that free gift of grace, accept it. Accept it, Jesus already paid for it, just accept the gift. Forgive yourself, forgive yourself. 
and receive the forgiveness of God. You say, how do I do that? It tells us in Romans, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And it says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God is raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So I wanna give you an opportunity, whether in the house or at home. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. It's not the words of the prayer, it's the nature of your heart. Amen. But Abba's house, help me. If you need Jesus, pray this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, you've been born again. The next thing you need to do is come down and tell one of these pastors, let us baptize you. Don't be ashamed. Everything's ready to roll. Some of you, you don't have a church home and you need to do life with other believers. Let's hear it for this young lady right here. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You always come. You'll never bother me. Come, come, come. Don't worry if I'm talking or what. You come when the Lord says to. But some of you need a church home. And we need you. Because let me tell you, God is relaunching this thing. It's brighter. It's more beautiful. God's bringing the right people in this place that love it, that want to see it do good, that know how to speak faith, that aren't stuck in yesteryear. Praise God. God's doing a new thing. Somebody say new thing. And I'm so grateful. And maybe you're a part of it. Whether you're online, now you can join online and come next week in person if you're close. If not, you can be part of our online campus. But I'm talking about those of you in the house today. Maybe the Lord's leading you to join our church. We'd love to have you if God's calling you. And only if he's calling you. And for, and for some of you, you've never been baptized. You weren't baptized when you were saved and today you're gonna be. So I have you stand on your feet today. We're going to worship a little bit. Listen, if God's moving. Listen to him. You calm down. We'll take you to the baptistry. We'll do whatever we need to do. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who've already stirred the waters today. We give you all the praise and all the glory for the great things that you're doing in our church. Lord, move today. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Save the lost. Stir the waters of the spirit, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You come. You be obedient to the Lord today.